Good evening, everybody. It's so nice to see so many of you out here on this very cold February night. Thanks for making the trip. Um, the most important announcement to make there are delicious refreshments at the back. Some you can homemade with uh, drinks as well. So please help yourself at any time if you like in the restrooms or whatever it is, by the way. Uh, my name is David Lepman. I am a South Orange resident. I am also in SOMA for Palestine, which is one of the sponsoring organizations of this event. I'm also a co-founder of Jews for Palestinian Light of Return. And I just let me take a second to tell you what we're going to do tonight. I'm going to give a brief overview of BDS. Then we're going to hear from Alexander Shalom from the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU New Jersey. He's going to talk about the lawfare campaign uh, against uh, BDS, to silence BDS. And then we're going to have a discussion. Uh, there's going to be a discussion between John Gordon and Leila Saad, who are also uh, Soma for Palestine um, members and co-founders. And I'll give a little more detail. Um, oh, there. Yeah. Miraculous. I'll give a little more uh, fuller biographies when, when we get to the speakers. And then we're hoping to go through this relatively quickly and then get to you guys to have a discussion with you all for questions or comments we'd love to hear. Uh, before, actually, I'm going to have to turn this off for one second because I've got to thank our co-sponsors, which I want to do before we get started. The co-sponsors for tonight's event are Al Auda New York, the Palestine Right to Return Coalition, American Muslims for Palestine, New Jersey, Council on American Islamic Relations, New Jersey, Green Party of New Jersey, Jews for Palestinian Right of Return, Jewish Voice for Peace, Northern New Jersey, and New Jersey Revolution Radio, which is here live streaming the event. Okay, now let me go back to my presentation. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement against Israel tonight. And this is from the BDS website, which you can access, and in fact, I encourage you all to go up there. There's a ton of information about BDS up there. It's bdsmovement.net. And if you go there, this is the logo that you see, and it has the initials of BBS. It has the call for freedom, justice, and equality. And some of you may know this character, others of you may not, that's Handala. Handala is the creation of uh, Naji Al-Ali, who was a very famous uh, Palestinian cartoonist and artist. And it was originally conceived, he was originally conceived as a 10-year-old Palestinian refugee from the 1948 ethnic cleansing of Palestine. We'll talk about that in a couple minutes. And he's always portrayed turned away from us with his hands behind his back in, in, in what uh, Ali describes as, as a posture of defiance against injustice. And I just wanted to share with you something that he said, this is um, Naji Al-Ali. And here's something he said about Handala. Handala was born 10 years old, and he will always be 10 years old. At that age, I left my homeland. And when he returns, Handala will still be 10, and then he will start growing up. The laws of nature do not apply to him. He is unique. Things will become normal again when the homeland returns. And by the way, when he says he left his homeland, he was from a family that was driven out of Palestine in 1948. Um, so if you go to the website, I think maybe the best place to start is with the words of what BDS says itself. What does it claim it is and what does it claim it's doing? And so this is the overview that you can find on the site. It was written a couple of years ago. That 70 years should not be for nearly. It should now be read 71. But it says, for nearly 70 years, Israel has denied Palestinians their fundamental rights and has refused to comply with international law. Israel maintains a regime of settler colonialism, apartheid, and occupation over the Palestinian people. This is only possible because of international support. Governments fail to hold Israel to account, while corporations and institutions across the world help Israel to oppress Palestinians. Because those in power refuse to act to stop this injustice, Palestinian civil society has called for a global citizen's response of solidarity with the Palestinian struggle for freedom, justice, and equality. This was put out originally in the summer of 2005. In other words, it's a call from around 170 Palestinian civil society organizations, a call for the world to respond to the call for justice. 
I think that's an important place to start because if you read the mainstream media in this country, you might often get the impression that BDS was started by a couple of rogue professors at universities here. And that's simply a lie. It is a call from Palestine and from the Palestinian people. Those of us here who support BDS support BDS. We support their call. And I think the next step, this sort of gives the overview of BDS as BDS describes it. The next step is to look at the three demands of BDS that comprise its platform. And again, in the words of what BDS itself says. Um, and I think, by the way, the great thing about looking at demands is that they not only tell you what people are asking for, they tell you the nature of the injustice that's been perpetrated against them. So you learn what the problem is, and you learn what the remedies might be. So let's take a look at those demands. This is the intro to demands. The Palestinian BDS call urges nonviolent pressure on Israel until it complies with international law by meeting three demands. This is the first demand. Ending its occupation and colonization of all Arab lands and dismantling the wall. So by ending the occupation and colonization of all Arab lands, BDS is referring to what's called the 1967 occupation. Gaza, the West Bank, and the Golan Heights. That's the, the three areas that they have singled out as what they mean by the colonization of Arab lands. Uh, by the way, some of you may say, now wait a second, in 2005, didn't Israel withdraw from Gaza? They don't occupy Gaza anymore. That's not true. They, yes, the soldiers left and the settlers left, but the definition of occupation in international law has nothing to do with your physical presence in an area. The definition is exerting, exercising control, effective control over a region over which you have no sovereignty. And by that definition, Israel still today occupies Gaza. Um, the second half of this demand, dismantling the wall, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the wall. The Israelis call it the separation wall. Uh, it, it, in Arabic, it's referred to as the apartheid wall, which, uh, in our opinion, obviously much more accurately describes what it is. And that's what it looks like. I don't know if any of you have been to Palestine and seen this wall, but it's these large 10-meter slabs of concrete. Other places, it is a fence. It's also called the separation fence. And then there are turrets and emplacements at, at various points. And then at other points, there are military checkpoints that stop people, Palestinians, from coming and going, right? And so the wall functions not only on sort of a daily level of creating misery for Palestinians trying to move around to their jobs and their homes, but it also functions as a symbol of Israeli apartheid. And by the way, you will often see if you, if you go there, it's also become a canvas on the Palestinian side for resistance art. So there you see somebody pulling back the wall and letting in the view of the sea, which Palestinians used to have until they were ethnically cleansed and are no longer allowed. Uh, back in the refugees, that is. We'll talk about the refugees in a second. There's another example of the kind of resistance um, artwork that you see on, on the wall. Um, the second demand is recognizing the fundamental rights of the Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel to full equality. Roughly 20%, I think now approaching 21%, of the citizens of Israel are not Jewish their Palestinian or other identities. And they are treated fundamentally as second-class citizens by law. Um, the, uh, there are over 65 laws in Israel that either directly or indirectly discriminate against Palestinian citizens. Also, one historical fact, for the first 19 years after the creation of the state, Palestinians who managed to remain in what is now called Israel were not even treated as second-class citizens. They were ruled under military law. In 1966, that changed when Israel, partly as part of a public relations campaign, conferred second-class citizenship on them. Um, and one way of finding out about these laws, if you want to know the details and the facts of these laws, is to go to the Adala site. That's the Legal Center for Arab Minority Rights in Israel. And if you click on, I think it's the Legal Advocacy link, you find their discriminatory laws database where they have kept uh, a record of all of the discriminatory, the, the laws that discriminate against Palestinians. And in their own words, this is what they say. These laws limit the rights of Palestinians in all areas of life, from citizenship rights 
to the right of political participation, land and housing rights, education rights, culture and language rights, religious rights, and due process rights during detention. Some of the laws also discriminate against other groups such as gays, non-religious Jews, and Palestinian refugees, which again we'll talk about in a second. And then if you click on the actual database, there you get a whole list of the laws. And if you click on the law, it tells you what the law is, when it was initiated, how it functions, and how it particularly, in what ways it discriminates against Palestinian citizens. And they make a point that some of the laws are what they call discrimination on its face, meaning the law itself describes what the discrimination is. In other cases, the law, it's neutral language to the law, but in fact, the de facto application of the law is to discriminate against non-Jewish citizens. Um, and perhaps the biggest sort of reification or reaffirmation of this uh, apartheid structure of Israel was the passage last year in July of 2018 of the nation state law, as it's called. And this law, which was pushed by the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, declared that Israel is the state of one people and one people only. Not the Israeli people, which is what we would expect any country to say, but the Jewish people. So even though 20% of the population is not Jewish, the, they, and, and, and even though they're citizens, they do not belong to the nation. And if you extrapolate that to, to this country, that would be as if 60 million Americans were told, you're citizens, but this nation isn't yours. You don't belong to it. Um, and then the third demand is respecting, protecting, and promoting the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and properties as stipulated in UN Resolution 194. And of course, there's a whole historical discussion that could go on here now. I'm gonna go, this is gonna be a very quick slice of that discussion. But when Israel was established in 1948, there was a, the majority of the population were not Jewish. It was Arab, uh, Arab non-Jews were the, comprised the majority of the population. This conflicted with the idea of a Jewish state that the Israeli, soon to be Israeli settlers envisioned. And when they said Jewish state, they didn't just mean a state where Jewish people lived. They didn't mean a place where Jewish people lived with full equality for everybody. Because if that were the definition of a Jewish state, someone could qualify. I'm Jewish, I live here, and I'm treated full equality under the law. They had something different in mind. One where there was an overwhelming majority of, uh, of the population was, Israel, was Jewish, and where Jewish people would control the state in the name of Jews worldwide. Um, and uh, uh, that they encountered, obviously, a big obstacle. Most of the people living there were not Jewish. So there was a campaign to drive out the maximum number of non-Jews that they could effectively remove. The number, according to, depends where you look, but it's usually considered between 750 and 850,000 people. Uh, and that is referred to in Arabic as the Nakba, or catastrophe in English. That's a very famous picture of Palestinian refugees uh, fleeing uh, the fight. The UN passed a, re passed a resolution 194, which required uh, their return, which re reaffirmed their inalienable right to return to their homes. Israel has been denying that right since 1948. So we're now in the 71st year. And some of you may remember last year, you might have heard of something called the Great Return March. In the media here, it was talked about as a conflict between Hamas and Israel, which is a complete misrepresentation. Overwhelmingly, the, 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 the citizens, the, the residents of Gaza, are either refugees from the 1948 Nakba, or are descendants of those refugees. And this was a grassroots movement on the part of those refugees to take right of return, their inalienable right of return, into their own hands. And they organized a grassroots campaign to march to the board, to march to the fence, the secure, the, uh, the separation fence, and attempt, some of them, to actually climb over and say we are returning. Some of them were shot dead by the Israelis for doing that. Uh, the key, you may have seen, has become a very powerful symbol of right of return. Palestinians will tell you we still have the keys to the front doors to our houses that we were expelled from in 1948, and they still hold on to the key. So you'll see a lot of artwork and a lot of documentation has Palestinians holding their keys. This is Lamise Deek. Some of you may know Lamise. 
She was originally supposed to speak here. Unfortunately, she wasn't feeling well, so she couldn't make it. But uh, this is her speaking uh, uh, in the city, and she has said a great thing about the right of return. The right to return is the right to remain. The idea of remaining on your homeland, that right. Um, lastly, I just want to say that the BDS campaign is itself based on earlier boycott campaigns, highly respected campaigns that many of us uh, participated in. Um, and three that come to mind are the boycott campaign against South Africa, apartheid South Africa. Uh, the middle one is not a poster. That is a black working people walking to work during the Montgomery bus boycott, honoring not taking the bus, but boycotting the bus company and, and walking to work. And this is when I remember growing up in California. This was the first political campaign I got, got involved in. My parents didn't drag me to. It was the United Farm Workers boycott grapes and boycott iceberg lettuce, neither of which I could eat until I was about 43. Just the thought of eating grapes <laughs> and iceberg lettuce was so embedded in me, you weren't supposed to do that because of the boycott. Um, and what all these boycotts, including BDS against apartheid Israel, have in common is they're all generated from the people who are actually suffering from the oppression. They all single out the perpetrator of the injustice, and they all propose remedies for restorative justice. Um, and I just want to end before we move on with one thought that I had putting together this presentation. I've never seen anything like this in the mainstream media of this country. The Sunday Times Magazine has never done anything like this. I've never seen a 60 Minutes segment where they talk about this. In fact, I did a little experiment before this event. I went online and found as many anti-BDS articles as I, could, as I could find in a couple of scans on Google. And I came up with 22 articles. 20 of them did not mention a single thing covered in this presentation, including what the three demands of BDS are in the first place. They are not even mentioned. They're not even mentioned to, to dispute them. They are simply ignored. One of them mentioned the 60, uh, the 21st article mentioned the 67 occupation, and the 22nd article mentioned the refugee situation. But 20 out of 22 articles didn't mention anything having to do, do with this. And so just to wrap up, what I'll say is that made me question, why? Why is that? I mean, if you think these things are wrong or untrue, wouldn't you want to make a huge point about that? Wouldn't you want to bring it up at every opportunity? You'd want to challenge it. And the, I think, and this is my opinion, that the reason that this is not challenged is because supporters or enablers of apartheid Israel either know or intuit that they have no answer for this. They can't deny it as history because it's true. And they can't refute it morally because it is just. And so that leaves them two options. Either to ignore the truth in the hopes it will go away, or to attack the truth in the hopes that they can silence people advocating for it. And on that note, that sounds like a good transition uh, to Alexander, who's going to talk to us. Do you want me to read your bio for everybody else? No? no I'll, 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 I'll tell them everything they need to know. Okay, so let me just put that there, and there we go. Thanks. So my name is uh, Alex Shalom. I am a lawyer at the American Civil Liberties Union of New Jersey, and I live in South Orange. I think that's kind of the, the critical things you need to know. I will say, uh, one thing I was thinking about when David was talking is I had a very different reaction to the Boycott Great campaign, which is to say I'm, I think, a little younger than David, so this was imposed on me by my parents. Uh, and when United Farm Workers lifted the boycott and said, go ahead and have green grapes, I dug in and I thought there had never been a sweeter fruit I never tasted than the first time I had a green grape. It really blew my mind. Um, so I am here, uh, I, I told you I'm a South Orange resident, but I'm here in my capacity as a lawyer for the ACLU. Uh, and I, let me just be totally clear, the ACLU takes no position on BDS. So what I'm here to talk to you about is not everything David just talked about, but instead, a series of laws that have been proposed and enacted, varyingly, around the country, uh, designed to attack BDS, about which the ACLU has grave concerns, and I think you all should too, whether or not you support BDS. And so uh, I have lots of friends who are uh, avid Zionists, 
and also think these laws are incredibly dangerous. Um, and so let me just, uh, here's my plan. I'm gonna talk about the laws. I'm gonna focus first on the law that passed in New Jersey, but I'll talk about some of the laws uh, on the federal level and in other states. I'm gonna tell you what my concerns are, what the ACLU's concerns are, both constitutionally and as a matter of policy. I'm gonna tell you about some of the legal challenges and tell you about what some of the obstacles are to bringing other legal challenges. And obviously I'm happy to take questions at any point. So, uh, New Jersey passed a law in, gosh, I think it was 2016, uh, called, yeah, it was definitely 2016, S. 1923. Uh, and it had lots of policy statements about why New Jersey didn't like BDS, but the policy statements were just that. They were policy statements. But the, what the law did is it said that effectively no company that supported BDS could be invested in by the Department of Pensions. The pension fund could not invest in any company that supported BDS. It called, for, and that was true whether they supported all of the demands of BDS, some of the demands, any of the demands, they would be singled out to not be invested in. And it called for the State Investment Council and the director of the Division of Investment, not a group I'm totally familiar with, but the people in charge of the pensions, to conduct investigations to figure out what companies supported BDS. And it included among the tools they were required to utilize uh, the retention of an independent research firm to identify companies that boycott Israel. Okay, so, so that's the New Jersey law. There are kind of, there's one other variant. Uh, other states have similar versions in their state. And then another variant is to say we're gonna do that, this kind of anti-pension investment piece. And what we're going to do is we're gonna make a requirement that government contractors must sign an oath that says, I do not participate in BDS. And when we think of government contractors, my first thought is like, you know, subcontractors and big companies. But in fact, I'll tell you about what's happened in some places. Um, in Kansas, a woman was a, a teacher, a, a, like a senior teacher, and she had been appointed to be a teacher trainer, to run teacher trainings for the state. So she was gonna get some money from the state to do other teacher trainings. That required her to be a state contractor. Her church participated in the BDS movement and she did not believe in good conscience she could sign the affirmation that she wouldn't participate. Um, so she is a single person or a single family, uh, not a huge economic powerhouse that's churning through Kansas, but she you know, didn't buy Sabra hummus or whatever her contribution to BDS was uh, that was enough to prohibit her from going to this teacher training. In Texas, lawsuit, a lawsuit was just filed on behalf of four people, uh, two of whom their contracting with the state of Texas was that they were going to judge debate competitions, and there was some travel honorarium associated with it. Um, so those are, in many ways, or always, frankly, more problematic even than the law that New Jersey passed. Um, and I'm gonna tell you about one more, and then I'm gonna tell you why I think they're so problematic. Uh, you may have heard that uh, S-1, the first bill that the new Senate voted on that dealt after the shutdown, that dealt with lots of important things, right? It's the first bill, uh, dealt with kind of supporting states that enact these anti-BDS laws. So it was this bill that was proposed and had tons and tons of co-sponsors. Included among co-sponsors was Senator Booker, our Senator Cory Booker. And then, so, and so what the bill basically said is we're removing a federal preemption defense against these suits. It's boring lawyer stuff, but basically, normally, the federal government gets to decide when we boycott countries, right? None of us can do business with Iran, with North Korea, with other places, because the federal government has prohibited that. And so the, the essential argument is they make the decision and we're not gonna subcontract that to states or counties or so forth. That's the argument, who knows whether it would win, and the S-1 removes that argument. After the concerns were raised, uh, 21, I believe, senators voted no on the bill, which means 79 voted yes. Included among the senators who voted no on the bill was Cory Booker, one of the sponsors of the bill. So that's not the usual, right, how a bill becomes a law. It's usually not that a sponsor withdraws his support. 
uh, just so you all know. So the bill passed, and so I'm to the House. I'm going to tell you how every senator who's running for president, who's announced that he or she is running for president, voted, because it's vaguely interesting. Uh, so Booker, Sherrod Brown, who hasn't yet announced, uh, Kirsten Gillibrand, uh, Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren voted no. Uh, Amy Klobuchar voted yes. Rand Paul, who ran for president last time, voted no. Uh, Bob Menendez voted yes. I know he's not running for president, but I'm giving you the, the New Jersey angle. So that's the federal law. So let me talk a little bit about what the concerns are. I'm going to start, I, I think the concerns with the, whatever we want to call it, loyalty oath piece is, is more palpable. I'm not even going to talk about that. Let me focus on what our constitutional concerns are with the New Jersey law. The idea that pensions would choose where they invest based on these political statements. The first concern here is, and, and really what's at the heart of what animates the ACLU's concern, is that this is punishing not behavior of where you choose to spend your money, but speech. And, and I spent some time a minute ago talking to Rabbi Oritz, and I think I did a bad job explaining it, so hopefully you are my warm-up act and I can do a better job uh, explaining it here. Um, uh, we all, I think, make, I, let me not assume, I believe that the effort to divest from South Africa was both morally appropriate and highly effective. Right? I think the reason that the apartheid regime fell in South Africa, in part, was because of international isolation, including economic isolation. So if we assume that it's OK to say you can't buy, you can't use South African gold, right? isn't that a big export from South Africa? Any, any other exports we can use? But let's say gold. You can't buy South African gold under any circumstances. We are going to both prevent the people who want to use South African gold, because it's the shiniest, and people who want to use South African gold because they support apartheid. They're both equally prohibited from participating in commerce with South Africa. So we're not making the person, we're not making the question of whether they can do it based on why they want to do it, but what they are going to do. Are you going to invest in South Africa? If the answer is yes, you can't do it. That's what those laws say. Unlike that, what anti-BDS laws, anti-BDS laws don't compel companies to do business with Israel, right? There's 100 and, 185 countries in the world, and some people will buy their widgets from Israel, and some people will buy their widgets from Jordan, or Canada, or the United States, right? You might have no ex import export. Let's not use widgets, let's use figs, right? Israeli figs. And so imagine two different companies that could buy Israeli figs, but instead choose to buy Jordanian figs. Company one says, I am not buying Israeli figs because I think Jordanian figs are juicier. I like them more. The pension would have no problem with that choice. That's right. That's business, that's taste, that's whatever. Godspeed. The other company says, I want to buy Jordanian figs, even though I like Israeli figs, because I don't like Israel's politics. I, don't, I think Israel should get out of Gaza, should get out of the West Bank, should leave the Golan Heights, and therefore I'm going to buy Jordanian figs. That company would be punished. The first company wouldn't. They're both doing the same making the same business choice to buy Jordanian rather than Israeli figs. So it is the speech of the second company that is being punished, their, 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 their political intent rather than their action. The ACLU has for 50 years or so advocated for the right to boycott, whether that's in Montgomery or elsewhere, because it is a powerful tool for people without a, lot, without a lot of political power to use their economic wherewithal to essentially shop where they want to shop and, and send powerful political messages. This is the same for us. And then the question is, what chilling effect will it have? And so clearly, um, if a company wants to be invested in the, have the pension to invest in them, which we assume companies do, com companies of certain size like these do, they're not if they want that to happen, they're not going to announce why they don't want Israeli figs. Right? If they'll, they'll, they'll hope that people assume it's because they think the Jordanian ones are juicier. But that also prevents them from telling their story and encouraging their friends. But also, remember, companies 
don't speak. Individuals speak. Sometimes they speak for companies and sometimes they speak on their own. But imagine a public company. If the public company says, we are gonna to choose to buy Jordanian figs, but the CEO says, I think we should support, I support BDS, I would never buy anything in Israel, I think it's a terrible government, that private investigator who's mandated to be hired by the state is gonna certainly be wondering, curious, and maybe they get onto a list. And then, so what if it's not the CEO? What if it's a member of the board? What if it's a 20 person board and 19 people um, you know, are going to the APAC conference, but one person supports BDS publicly? How, how do you measure that? What if it's an employee? At what level are we saying that it is the company's choice, the company's speech, and, and what sort of invasive searches are gonna be involved in trying to make these political determinations? And what do we want? Are we comfortable with the government databasing our political beliefs? I will give you my answer. I am not comfortable with the government <laughs> databasing my political beliefs. Whether those beliefs are popular or unpopular, I just don't think that's the role for government. So uh, a couple things. I, I think I've, I've tried to at least explain why it's politically, constitutionally easy for a government to say, we are choosing not to invest in that state. In that. So for example, um, lots of states, I don't know if New Jersey did in the end, but New York certainly did, when, uh, when various states passed these horrible anti-transgender bills in the, the last couple of years, so Indiana under Mike Pence was one of them, New York then prohibited its state employees from traveling on government business to Indiana. And so that's a classic boycott. We're saying to Indiana, there is a political, uh, an economic consequence to your politics. And what that meant was a New Yorker couldn't go to Indiana to an anti-trans rally, but it also meant you couldn't go to Indiana to a, a basketball tournament, I mean, for state business, obviously you could still travel on your own, but you were prohibited regardless of the reason. And that doesn't then require that sort of inquiry into what people are thinking and why they think it. But I want to make another point, and it's, it's super important, because at the same time that the ACLU is a longtime supporter both of boycotts and First Amendment rights in general, the right to free speech and association in general, we're also supporters of anti-discrimination laws. We think anti-discrimination laws are appropriate. New Jersey's anti-discrimination law, called the Law Against Discrimination, prohibits discrimination based on national origin. And so if what the BDS movement said was, we're not gonna buy from Jews, obviously, but even if it said, we won't buy from Israelis wherever they live, that would be forbidden by the law, of uh, law against discrimination and we would, we would oppose that. That's not what the BDS movement says. It says, we're not gonna buy from Israel. So if you have an Israeli business owner in New Jersey, an Israeli business owner in London, wherever, to, to choose not to shop there because they're Israeli is discrimination based on nationality. To choose not to support a business based in Israel is not discrimination based on nationality. That is the, the kind of classic political distinction. Okay, um, challenges. So these laws started cropping up probably in about 2015. 14 to 16, somewhere around there. And almost immediately the challenges began. Um, so some of the laws were proposed and lawyers wrote letters saying this law is unconstitutional and the legislature backed off. In other places they did not. So I told you about Kansas with the, the teacher. In Arizona there was a lawyer who was a sole practitioner and in his personal capacity he participated in the BDS movement. He wanted his law firm, which was, you know, Joe Smith LLP, it was the same thing, just the, the corporate version of it, to also participate, but he had a contract to represent people in the jail, and he couldn't do that if, he, uh, if his business entity supported BDS. So uh, ACLU lawsuits were filed in Kansas, Arizona, Texas, and Arkansas. The, the Texas one is the most recent one. It was filed in, uh, on December 18th of last year, so just two months ago. Um, on January 23rd, uh, there was a bad decision out of Arkansas, bad from the ACLU's perspective, which is to say the ACLU lost. 
Um, we think it's a poorly reasoned decision. We have a brief on behalf of 50 preeminent, no problem, 50 preeminent uh, constitutional law, First Amendment scholars who say it's a bad decision. And it's also contrary to the good decisions we got in 2018 in the District of Kansas and the District of Arizona, both of which enjoined the law, which is to say, stop the law from going into effect because it violated the First Amendment. And so these are the, the, the questions that are going to be addressed today are emotional ones. They're ones that, that hit people in all different places, and for good reasons. It's a, it's a, they're emotional issues, and they should be. But sometimes, and this is the ACLU's position, even if you think it's a, a worthy cause, which is to say ending BDS is a worthy cause, I'm not saying that's the ACLU's position, but even if we thought that, the solution proposed by the government is worse than the problem. The solution proposed by the government is to, um, to really intrude into what people are thinking, what people are saying, and, what, and that is the, the kind of exactly what the First Amendment is supposed to protect us against. And so there will be future challenges. Um, one obstacle to challenges, forthrightly, is that you need to have what's called standing, which is a person who is affected. And so take the New Jersey example. In order to bring a challenge, you need someone to get banned from uh, the participation in the pension. And most folks aren't going to wave their hand and, and volunteer for that job. So there, there might be some ways around it, um, but you know, that's that. And, and so last, last obstacle is there have been a series of cases from the Supreme Court that have said, listen, the government gets to choose its own speech as well. And New Jersey can basically vote with its wallet. It can say what it supports and what it doesn't support based on where it invests. And, and we think that's true. But what we don't think that authorizes it to do is to go through the process that these bills propose, which is to say it can choose where it wants to invest its money for sure, but not at the expense of these you know, invasive inquiries into people's political beliefs. And, and it can't, we also don't want the government to, to, to penalize political speech. We can, government can penalize bad politics or reward good politics, but when it's the speech itself that it targets is when it gets particularly dangerous. So I'm going to turn it over to these folks to talk more about BDS, and I'm going to stick around for the Q&A part. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, I'm going to, I am going to read a couple of read bios here. So um, two co-founders of Someone for Palestine, John Gordon, Layla Saad. Layla is a Palestinian American whose father was a Palestinian refugee from Haifa in what is now Israel. She studied issues to do with the Palestinian question as a graduate student, especially focusing on US economic, political, and military support for Israel. Layla is a freelance writer and editor and lives in Maplewood with her husband and three children. John Gordon is a Palestinian American whose mother is a 1948 Palestinian refugee from Yaffa. He is a resident of Maplewood with his wife and two children. Take it away. Thank you. Thank you, David. We're going to um, uh, go through a few questions, sort of the main points to cover somewhat for Palestine and BDS. We're just going to ask each other and respond to them, and then we'll open up for Q&A afterwards. Can everyone hear me OK? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say we're standing in for Lamise Deek, who you saw in that picture. Um, we, I don't think we'll do the topic justice in the way she could have, but bear with us. We're going to try to keep it conversational, and then we'll open up to questions, and we look forward to that. So I'll start with the first question. So Layla, can you please tell the audience about the BDS resolution that was originally proposed and prompted uh, you and all of us to start the group Soma for Palestine? So what happened is about a year ago um, in our township, we live, this is Maplewood, the next town over is South Orange, and the two towns are sister towns. We call them Soma for short, uh, or Mapso. Um, and <laughs> there's a debate about that, but that's a hot topic, so we're not covering that today. <laughs> um, so a group of people came to our township committee, the Maplewood Township Committee, 
they had gone to a number of other towns around here and applied to those township committees and asked them to pass a resolution to condemn BDS. And <clears throat> it actually passed in a couple of townships nearby here. So they came to Maplewood, uh, maybe unwittingly, not knowing that there were some Palestinian Americans living in this town, some activists living around here who would care about this issue. And um, they went to the township committee and asked that it pass this resolution to condemn BDS. It wasn't like a binding resolution. It wasn't like one of the state resolutions or the, uh, or the federal law or anything like that, but it was sort of a statement that they wanted the uh, township committee to get behind. And when we found out about that, a bunch of us got together, we started talking, we started you know, talking about what, how we wanted to respond, and we um, wrote a letter, got a number of residents to sign it, and then went to the township committee meeting and explained why we thought they should not um, accept the resolution or pass the resolution. And we won. <laughs> It's a little victory, but we'll take it as a victory. Uh, I think the most important thing is that it, 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 we made it, we sent a message that there are people who are interested in this topic in this town. There are people who are happily pro-Palestinian and happy to talk about this topic, and that there are so many of us too who care about the free speech issue that um, Alex talked about. So for all those reasons, uh, we think it made you know, it sort of represented our town perfectly. Yeah, and I, and, was, I yeah. can add, and since then we've uh, had a couple programs, this is our, I think our third official event, um, to uh, talk, discuss these issues. Our first event was here at the library. It was a, a Black Palestinian Solidarity event, and we had a, a local minister, Niall Fort, who grew up in Maplewood, South Orange area, and uh, a Palestinian, um, Fatin uh, Gerard was here as well, sorry. And um, so we're trying to have these events to educate everyone who doesn't know as much about these issues and to present our position on these because as already was stated, our position is not in the mainstream media as Palestinians and we want people to hear our voice as well. So our little conversation, we're not gonna talk about the legal side of these issues, we're gonna talk about the moral, ethical reasons why we're supporting BDS in the first place, why we think everybody should be supporting BDS, and, and what we see it bringing about. So on that note, John, can you talk about the three demands of the BDS movement? Ending the occupation, ending apartheid, and the right of return for refugees, and especially why is it so important? Why is the right of return for refugees probably the most important of those demands? Um, well, I, I wanted to, to say that these, these demands, while they're the demands of BDS, they've honestly been the demands of Palestinians since the very beginning. It's been, as David said, 71 years since the Nakba in 1948. And my family left in 1948, and my grandfather spent his whole life fighting for these issues. So the BDS is really just a formulation or a, like I, I was saying before, a strategy to to um, have a strategy to, to implement these demands through boycott, divestment, and sanction. So the right of return is is very important to. I mean, there's refugees from Palestinian refugees all around um, historic Palestine and the neighboring countries here in the U.S. and all over the world, and it's the law that they have the right to return to their homes. And this is this is the demand of the Palestinians. Yeah, and I just want to add that so so my father, for example, is a, a refugee from Haifa, which is now in Israel, and uh, or what is now is called Israel. Um, when he was about three year old, three years old, they were living in a small village in the north of um, Palestine, and. It, in 1948, the pre-Israeli military, the Zionist military, so these are mainly uh, Zionist settlers, uh, European settlers, coming from different parts of Europe who want to settle the land of Palestine to become a Jewish state. Um, they began bombing different towns and, as you know, expelling people, 750,000 as far as we know, maybe more, and uh, the, the house next door to my parents' house but next door to my father's house was bombed and a small child was killed. And so his family 
said, that's it, we have to leave, and they fled for the border of Lebanon. And they were never allowed back since then, even when my dad's uncle had appendicitis and needed to be rushed to the hospital. They couldn't get back, and so he died. And anyway, this is one story among so many stories. This is almost like an easy story, actually, because my dad was lucky enough that his father spoke English, they went to Lebanon, he found a job, they flourished relatively for Palestinians in Lebanon. That's another story. That was a difficult life, too, because there are Lebanese who discriminated against Palestinians. But the point is, many others lived so much more difficult in lives in, uh, in refugee camps. And, and that's what the right of return is about. That's why BDS talks about it, because there's no fair or just solution to this problem until Israel recognizes, and the United States, frankly, <laughs> recognizes that um, all of those people who have been, been displaced, all of their um, descendants, not to mention all those who were displaced in the 1967 occupations of Gaza and Jerusalem and the West Bank, are all allowed to return home and live in dignity, equality, and justice in their homeland. So Leila, if BDS were to be successful in its demands, what would it look like? What does BDS, and what do you envision for the future? It is, a, is it a one-state solution, a two-state solution, or something uh, else altogether? Um, it's clear to me, and I, I don't know that the BDS movement technically talks about this, but it's clear to me that if every Palestinian refugee was allowed the right to return to their homeland, there would no longer be a Jewish state. And that is because, it's because, not because we're calling for the destruction of anybody, as some people like to say, it's because you would then have a situation, whether it was one state, whether it was two states, whether it was three states or more, you'd have a situation where everybody was given equal rights under the law, everybody is allowed to live in the same territory, and, uh, Nobody's occupied, in this case, you know, we're talking about the demand of BDS to end the occupation. There wouldn't be a government occupying another person's land, but they would all be living in dignity and equality together. So uh, there are a lot of us in this movement, and probably in this room, who support a one-state solution. I actually say that, you know, it really doesn't matter whether it's one state, two state, or 18 states. The point is the same. When you have the right of return for people, when you have the end of the occupation of the 1967 territories, and when you have a, um, an end to the apartheid laws in Israel that discriminate against non-Jewish citizens and prioritize the rights of uh, Jewish citizens over them, when you get rid of all of that, you have uh, like democracy, equality, you don't have segregation any longer. You don't have a separate but equal situation that, you know, us Americans know so much about. So that's what I think uh, you'd have if the BDS movement were successful, and, and frankly, I think that's what you will have one day. Um, so John, BDS co-founder Omar Barghouti has said, accepting modern day Jewish Israelis as equal citizens and full partners in building and developing a new shared society free from all colonial subjugation and discrimination, as called for in the democratic state model, is the most magnanimous, rational offer any oppressed indigenous population could present to its oppressors. So don't ask for more. Can you talk about that? I, I think this, this is touching on also what you, you were just saying before, that um, a shared equal society where people have equal rights, the rights to vote, the rights to be represented and self-determination for their their families and their people. Um, that's the the, the great a, a great solution to this problem. Um, I think anything less is is you know you, you're, you're the situation where some people have more rights than others and discrimination is is basically the rule of law. That's that's unacceptable. That's unacceptable in any democratic society. So. How could you not have a democratic society with everyone with equal representation, equal voice? No one should be 
um, more important than another person and have more rights and more benefits than another person. We all should be equal. It's just, it's the basis of any, any government in the world should be this way. Not all governments in the world are this way, of course, but they should be. And uh, I just, I just want to add that I think, I think the BDS movement is calling for the bare minimum, right? And right. I think that's sort of the argument that, or, or right. the, the point of this, this, uh, this quote is that at a bare minimum, we're talking about throwing off the yoke of colonialism. I mean, this is like, you know, it's hard to argue this in this day and age because Israel, it, and especially in the United States, although I don't think that's true everywhere in the world. I think there are a lot of places in the world where this is this conversation is not a dangerous one, it's not a scary one, and it's not one that's going to be condemned or silenced, right? So that's one thing to remember. If you're on the side of BDS, don't feel alone. <laughs> you might in the U.S. when you're here, you, you might feel that, right? It might feel kind of like ah, I'm the only one thinking this, but. I'd say the majority of the world's population is on your side. Um, but my point is that, you know, this is about ending a settler colonial occupation of another people's lands. Um, we've been through that, right? And we've overcome it. We overcame it in Algeria. And we overcame it in South Africa. The prime example, because BDS and Palestinian um, the Palestinian people look to the South African people for strength and for um, tactics and for strategies and ways to represent themselves and get the support of the world's people on their side. But we've overcome colonialism in Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. We've overcome uh, you know, settler colonialism around the world. And during that movement that, that uh, you know, that movement of the 60s and 70s especially, when we were fighting those fights, there was a new kind of settler colonialism that became more powerful than ever before. And Israel is the prime example of that. South Africa too, but since things have at least changed enough in South Africa, not to the point that we all want them to, but at least legally things have uh, you know, changed enough. But in Israel, you know, Israel continued to argue that for its own self-determination, right? That there should be a land for a certain people, an ethno-religious state for the Jewish people, whether they consider themselves ethnically um, alike or religiously alike. That's what they're asking for. They're asking for a state for, their, for themselves. But that's not the same thing as anti-colonial liberation. In this case, the settler col colonists are supported by the world's powers, right? That's how Israel was established in the first place. Israel was established under the arm of the British Empire. And it's been held closely safeguarded, particularly since 1967, by the warmth of the United States, the world's superpower. So it's not the same kind of uh, liberation movement that you see elsewhere. It's not the same kind of self-determination movement that you see elsewhere. The anti-colonial liberation movement in this case is the Palestinians. And that's why you have the support of the world's people, I think, on their side. I think, just to add to that, there's many nations that were under colonialism or still are to some effect. And um, there's a lot of ripple effects of colonialism. And colonialism is a system that needs to end for everybody because it just puts down people's rights. I mean, Puerto Rico is a perfect example of how the United States mm -hmm. has control over Puerto Rico, and they don't have control of their own destiny in many cases, especially we've seen what's been going on the past few years. Haiti is suffering from mm -hmm. all kinds of actions that the U.S. is taking, and they're keeping behind the scenes, just like the actions they take against Palestinians behind the scenes. So, we see these things happening in many nations, and we're definitely in solidarity with those nations as Palestinians. And our movement is, I think, probably more powerful for it, for, for all of us together. Which leads us to our next question, yes. conveniently. We have many prominent people of color, rep rep representatives Ilan Omar and Rashida Tlaib, 
Um, Professor Mark Lamont Hill, Dr. Angela Davis have recently come under attack for supporting BDS. Why are activists of color particularly vulnerable to these attacks? And Soma for Palestine held another event which we mentioned that black Palestinian solidarity for freedom and justice for both peoples. Can you please talk about that? Yeah, and, and I'll talk about maybe the second part of the question first. So we held that event um, here in the Maplewood Library. It was a fantastic event with uh, Niall Ford, a minister from Newark, and a Palestinian activist from New York with El Auda. And the idea there and in all of the, like, this, I mean, in other words, it's not just happening here in Maplewood. This has been a, a larger movement where black activists and Palestinian activists have been coming together, supporting one another, and um, sharing ideas and sharing support and, and strategies, too, for how to bring about the, the justice and freedom for both of those people and all other subjugated and colonized and um, occupied people around the world. But there's something particular about those two. And I think it was, you know, sort of notably sparked um, around the time of Ferguson when there were a lot of black, black activists out in the streets and uh, Palestinians were sending them messages of support on Twitter and um, you know elsewhere, and and giving them very practical advice even about uh, you know when you get tear gas, pour milk in your eyes. And black activists were running to the store and buying milk and bringing it with them to protests, knowing that that would protect them. And then I think there were a, a number of um, black activists who started traveling to um, Palestine to visit and see what it was like in the occupied territories and to speak to Palestinians and hear about what they've been going through. And Palestinians in turn were talking to black activists and finding out about conditions in the United States and how to support them better. And, and the Black Lives Matter or the Movement for Black Lives Matter um, formally adopted as part of their platform um, support for the BDS movement. And that was probably the most controversial part of their platform, mm -hmm. that they supported Palestinian rights, which is crazy, right? <laughs> because here we are, they're, you know, innocent black men are getting killed in the streets. Um, the police are just like, you know, closing in on each other to protect themselves. So it's clear that state power is not interested in the Black Lives Matter movement, but the thing that they got the most flack for was their support for Palestine. Um, and I think that's why you see, that's, that has something to do with why you see these uh, prominent um, and outspoken and smart and intelligent and courageous and, and proud people like Ilan Omar, Rashida Tlaib, uh, you mentioned Angela Davis, Mark Lamont Hill, who've been attacked viciously for supporting Palestinian rights um, and for supporting BDS or supporting um, the end of the occupation, the right of return, all these things that are just sort of basic, the basic, the very basic of, under international law and frankly human decency. And when they speak up for these things, they get attacked you know, even more viciously. You're, you're always open to attack as a person of color who's, um, who's vocal about rights issues. Uh, and I think combine that with speaking up about Palestinian rights and you're doubly targeted. And we should mention Michelle Alexander coming up. And Michelle Alexander too, support, yeah. So. so we wanted to talk at the end. Um, before we turn it over to questions about the best ways for us as activists, concerned citizens, to respond to critics of BDS. And I'll start if you don't mind. Um, there, you, we can go through like all the you know, sort of main criticisms of the BDS movement. But before I do that, I just want to say that the, I think the number one most powerful thing you can do to respond to those criticisms is to know that you're right. Know that you stand on the side of justice. Know that you stand on the right side of history. And know that what you're standing for are the very least that we could ask for under international law. For human rights, we're asking for equality, for justice, for dignity, 
We're against colonialism. We're against imperialism. There's nothing to be ashamed in any of those things. You should only feel that you're right about those things. You have people around you. You may not, may not always feel like that in, in the United States, but there's, you should, you should feel really, really certain about that, even when people get attacked, and even when uh, it's uncomfortable or it can be difficult to talk about those things. Um, and then secondly, I would say, I think the most important thing for us to do is to not get drawn into those arguments. <coughs> because the attacks of anti-Semitism, um, probably foremost, but the attacks, um, it, I, I'd say that is the foremost argument, right? What, isn't that the foremost argument against BDS right now, that it's anti-Semitic? So what I think you need to do is, you have to discard that argument quickly. It's very clear this is not an anti-Semitic movement. It's incredibly clear, and it's very easy to make that clear right away. Because the Palestinian people don't care if Israelis are Jewish, if they are Hindu, if they're agnostic, or if they're aliens, right? The Palestinian people don't care who they are. They care that they came to their land, took their homes, dispossessed them, expelled them, and didn't allow them to return. And those who did stay, they discriminate against them. Of the 65, 50, whoever, however many laws there are, they discriminate against them in terms of the property they can buy. The people they can marry. They control who you can marry and who you cannot marry if you live in Israel and you're a Palestinian because you can't marry a Palestinian from the West Bank or Gaza. I mean, the control over people's lives is extreme. The discrimination and the racism is extreme. So the point is, <clears throat> I don't think we should be dwelling on how we're not anti-Semitic. I think we should be dwelling on the injustices. The injustices are many, and they can be documented over and over again, and that's our most powerful argument against any kind of criticism of BDS. And that may even be more powerful than this free speech argument. But it, that, that should be where we start. That's a bare minimum of what, of what we can do if we, if we care about Palestinian rights, and, and we want to support the BDS movement. Uh, thank you, you hit it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Okay, so we're going to do some uh, question and answer. And the way we're going to set it up is this. To fully democratize the discussion, anybody who wants to speak, you have one minute. That makes sure everybody who wants to talk gets a chance to talk. And in that one minute, you can do uh, whatever you like. You can ask a question. You can share some thoughts of your own. Anything is welcome. Before we get to that, um, Abdul Mubarak Rowe is going to make a statement representing CARE New Jersey. Yes. And uh, here we can turn this like this and you can fix it. Hey. Good evening. I'm Abdul Mubarak Rowe. I'm the communications director with CARE New Jersey. And I just want to say that CARE New Jersey, along with CARE National, stands in full support of the national and local BDS movements around the country. Uh, we had a chance to go to uh, Alabama last, uh, last year. And I had a chance to go to Montgomery. And I had a chance also in Birmingham to go to the Birmingham Civil Rights Museum. And we talked about the Birmingham, I mean the Montgomery bus boycott. And every time when I think about this particular movement, I'm reminded exclusively of the Montgomery Boys bus boycott because I was young at the time, but I remembered it very clearly. And I see a carbon copy of the attempts being made to suppress the boycott and stifle the boycott now, as was done similarly then. It went through the courts. They won on the basis of free speech. It was supported by the Supreme Court. One of the things I also want to issue, you were talking about the fact how, that, how popular this movement has become now. And I think what's, it, what's at issue is the fact that for so many decades, the Palestinians have not been humanized. We've always been seen the Palestinians as being less than human, terrorists, uh, not taking, not wanting to, uh, unreasonable demands, savages, and the other side being seen as 
heroes, and martyrs. And for once, for the first time in a long time, the Palestinian people now are being seen as rightful human beings with the rights of a human being, deserve the rights and privileges of a human being. And I think that's very, very important. Also, one last thing I want to point out, you talked about the fact how many African Americans now are beginning to embrace the Palestinian cause. I would offer to you that I, as a young man, was a part of the Black Catholic Party, the original Black Catholic Party, and of the original Nation of Islam. And we were very, 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 very supportive of the people of Palestine at that time in the late 1960s and 1970s, very clearly. So what you see with respect to this is a renewal of that solidarity, because we were there then as well as now. Thank you for your support. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abdul. And again, uh, Abdul's representing CARE, which was one of the co-sponsors of this event. So if anybody would like to uh, contribute to the discussion, uh, we've been asked for the purposes of the streaming event, please come up here and speak into the microphone. Yes, sir. And remember, one, one minute, please. If anybody can't get up to the microphone, let me know. Uh, my name is uh, Shaka Zulu, and I'm chairman of the New African Black Panther Party and the United Panther Movement. I was just, just recently released from prison, and I can tell you, political prisoners that were with me in prison, when the BDS movement came down, we studied it, we looked at it, we examined it, and we wrote a statement. Jalil Mutakim, Mumia Abu Jabal, and they said that the BDS movement need to be supported because it is the right of Palestinian people to affirm their dignity, to affirm their humanity, and to be free. And now that I'm on the outside, I want to unequivocally state that the New African Black Panther Party, which is in the tradition of the original Black Panther Party, in 1971, Huey P. Newton went to Palestine. He visited with Yasser Arafat, the PLO, and he said that the Black Panther Party stand in solidarity with you. And, it, and, and when you get your freedom, we will get our freedom. Because all oppressed people around the world have to weaken imperialism by standing together. And we reaffirmed that today in 2019. The new African Black Panther Party raised our fists in solidarity with the Palestinian people, with the Palestinian political prisoners. And we say that all oppressed people Whenever they are free, Palestine will be free because Israel is a part of that broad chain of imperialism. And when imperialism is defeated, all oppressed people around the world will be free. All power to the people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to respond yes. to those two comments because I really appreciate them. And I think uh, it, it, you're both absolutely right. This is not a new phenomenon. I, I erred if I, that's how I represented it. Uh, the PLO and, and the Palestinian Liberation Organizations in the 60s and 70s were um, deeply involved in international movement for anti-colonial and anti-imperialist struggle everywhere. And you know, interestingly, a lot of people came to Palestine from other or, and to Lebanon too, especially when. Palestinians were couldn't couldn't operate out, out of um, Palestine, and trained with and talked politics with and drew a lot of inspiration from the Palestinian struggle for liberation, and I think that's what you see now. I mean, it's it hasn't changed. It's changed in its character because you know we're in a different era, but it's all we're all part of that same global struggle for freedom and justice for people who. Um, have been oppressed, especially by the major powers of the uh, of the world. And at the moment, Israel. We talked about this earlier, but Israel's support from the United States is is like a key part of what's going on here and why we're in this situation. Um, and and that's been you you all know that's that's been support that's gone on both from the Democrats and from the Republicans, regardless of who's in power. And uh, it's to the tune of, you know, the latest deal is $38 billion over the next 10 years or something like that. Not to mention all the political and just social capital support that the U.S. Brings, gives to Israel. Um, but I just wanted to mention one more thing before we go to the next topic, which is about um, the way that uh, mass incarceration in the United States 
and political prisoners in the, in uh, in Palestine see so much in each other, and that's what our speaker I think was just referring to. You know, eight hundred thousand Palestinians have been imprisoned in the last since nineteen sixty seven. I mean, it's just basically like nearly, in, in the same way you see mass incarceration in the U.S., near, near almost every adult male at some point has gone in and out of the prison system. So it, there's a very similar system of control in place, and I think that's why there's so much solidarity between those people. Hi, um, my name is Carrie, and I had a question about Trump. Um, so he moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem. Um, Jared Kushner is going around with a peace plan, um, and Netanyahu is um, campaigning with giant photos of Trump and shaking his hand. Um, how is Trump good for the Palestinian movement? Um, how has Trump affected what's happening? And um, yeah, those are my main questions. Well, personally, I see all American presidents in the same boat in this matter because they've treated Palestinians the same way throughout. So Trump is, to me, is just a continuation of that prior policy of the United States. And the United States is, as we've already said, is giving full support, financial, military, to uh, Zionists the entire time it's been in existence. And I don't see, uh, moving the uh, embassy to Jerusalem, obviously it makes a lot of people upset, but you know, they're in control of the land there. The Palestinians have no control of the situation. There's not much Palestinians can do other than voice our, our uh, unhappiness with the situation when we condemn it. Because Jerusalem is a Palestinian city, it's part of the West Bank, and it will always be a Palestinian Arab city. And that is that will ne that is one of the things that the Palestinians will never give up. You know, uh, the Trump phenomenon is uh, I don't know if interesting is the right word, <laughs> but the Trump the Trumpists of the world. Uh, it's interesting about Israel that it's formed a alliance with somebody who's so right wing, who himself has made anti-Semitic comments, and who is, you know, undem undemocratic to his core, and just a nasty guy, a corrupt businessman. I could go on. The point is, Israel hasn't only made an alliance with Trump. He, Israel's also made an alliance with a lot of other right-wing populist governments that are coming to power around the world. That includes uh, Prime Minister Orban in Hungary, who himself has used anti-Semitic tropes against uh, George Soros's, you know, funding of organizations in in Hungary. Um, but Israel's also go moving right along happily with Bolsonaro in uh, in Brazil. Another right wing, super right wing, um, homophobic, sexist, uh, you name it. And it, you know, Israel doesn't have a, it, it sort of shows up the hypocrisy of Israel. It sort of like becomes all plain for everybody to see now. You know, those of us who are supporters of Palestine and Palestinians for a long time have been saying, there's something fundamentally wrong with the way this country was formulated. The thing that's fundamentally wrong with Israel is the way it was formulated and the way it continues to operate. It's not that Netanyahu is now like a crazy wacko right wing guy or something wrong with it. It was always like that. Like John was saying, the BDS call is making the call of Palestinians from the inception, from, their, from its inception, we were saying you can't take somebody else's land, kick them out, live there, and then you know, set it up only to your advantage. So to my mind, the sort of, the, the you know, Israel's relationship with all these far right wing governments is just showing it all up for us. Are you folks waiting to speak? Yeah, so why don't you come on up and then you can do that. Anyway. Uh, 
Uh, good evening, everybody. First and foremost, thank you so much to Soma for Kyle putting this event together. You guys are dope. You do a lot of great things. And, uh, thank you so much to uh, the speakers of the evening. Um, so I guess my question is mainly directed at Alex. Um, the anti-BDS legislation in the state of New Jersey sparked uh, my position with the organization that I work with, American Muslims for Palestine, um, it sparked my role as the government relations center for the organization. Uh, it was just the, the vacuum that the conversation existed within allowed for such a heavily one-sided uh, conversation and outcome. Um, and and when, we, when we initially started and we continue to do this today, in many instances when we talk about the negatives of these BDS bills and so on and so forth, we, we call into play the fact that it not, it's not only just immediate negative ripple effects, also secondary effects, such as legal challenges to, the, to these bills, as you mentioned. Um, the amount of money that costs the taxpayers uh, and the effort on the part of the government, what not, all plays into consideration. Things that should be taken into, you know, into consideration. Um, and you mentioned a critical uh, point that many of the other anti-BDS legislations in different states are being challenged on the grounds that they're forcing the employees or uh, you know people bidding for contracts <coughs> to sign this oath. In the state of New Jersey, how do you see it most effective to challenge these bills? Um, uh, on the basis of its intended purpose, as you know, as passed in the Assembly and Senate, what angle is the most effective, and what type of situation would call for the ability for our community to be able to spring into action and legally challenge this bill in its essence? Great, thanks for that question. So uh, you were referring to the, the ease with which the bill in New Jersey got through the Senate and Assembly, and just I, I realize I told you the votes of various US senators on S1, uh, but on, on the bill in New Jersey, uh, the Senate voted 39 to zero with one person not voting. I'm not, I honestly, it was Sam Thompson, uh, who's a Republican from uh, somewhere south of here, uh, and I honestly don't know if he just wasn't there, or, or if it was like a, it wasn't an abstention, it was a not voting, and in the uh, assembly there were a couple abstentions, a couple not votings, and three no votes. Uh, which included Sheila Oliver, a lieutenant governor, um, but, but mostly it went through very cleanly uh, despite uh, kind of a warning that, that we gave about the possibility of litigation. And, and that possibility still exists. Um, it, it is a, just from like a legal perspective, it is a more difficult case than the ones in Kansas and, and elsewhere. But I think conceptualizing it, it it's about chilling. It's, it's someone who, the idea is, I would be speaking up, but I fear for my business, and, and it is preventing me from speaking. Um, and, and there are also possibilities in New Jersey, though not elsewhere, of doing uh, organizational standing, where an organization like yours could actually be the plaintiff as opposed to a business owner, saying, we support BDS, part of our mission is to uh, get other people to support BDS, and we're having a harder job doing our institutional mission because of this law. So we can connect on that. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, everyone. My name is Matthew Johnson. Uh, I'm a resident of uh, South Orange, and I'm a member of the People's Organization for Progress. And um, I'm a college professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And I only have one minute, so I've <laughs> used, like, I guess, a third of that already. I wanted to, a lot of things I'd like to talk about, but my limited time, I want to talk about these attacks on our movement that are using the anti-Semitic uh, uh, issue. Um, they are very reminiscent for me of the attacks on our move on our movement against Jim Crow. And you know, uh, somebody earlier spoke about the Montgomery bus boycott, and um, that, as well as earlier efforts in the African American community against Jim Crow, and all the time, we were told that it was because of communist agitators that black people wanted their rights. But that label was used to try to deter us, and it never did. And then later, we talked about the anti-apartheid movement. And they tried to use labels to stop the anti-apartheid movement. Not only labels, but the US government officially designated Nelson Mandela 
and the African National Congress as terrorists. That's right. But it didn't deter us. And this anti-Semitism that they're raising now against our voices is not going to deter us. That's my That's That's very my well said. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is TJ Whitaker. I'm a local school teacher here at Columbia High School. I'm also one of the co-founding members of the Maxwell Freedom School. And I just want to make a brief uh, statement of solidarity. Um, one of the things that um, we've been trying to do, uh, again, I've been talking with Carrie Gordon, um, just spoke with David earlier. Um, we need to do um, a combined effort program at Columbia High School. We have to, we yes. have to make more people in we gotta make more people in our community uncomfortable around this issue. Like too many people are kind of just hiding out and, and staying in their rooms and their desks. Um, if we can work with you uh, to create a program at Columbia High School, we need to have this larger discussion in front of our young people so that they can pick up the baton and start to you know, fight this same fight. So again, I thank you for coming. Thank you for having this program. Uh, we support someone for Palestine. All power to the people. Thank you, TJ, and our answer is yes. <laughs> um, but I just want to say one thing. You brought up a really important point, which is that probably the most important constituency right now is younger people. It's not us, because it's hard enough to get... <laughs> I look younger than I am. <laughs> it's hard enough to... You know, it's hard still. It's hard, like you said. Too many people are uncomfortable around this issue. but. The next generation doesn't feel the same as we do. They, and that's on a lot of issues, right? Because they're living in a different world than we grew up in, those of us who are represented by my <laughs> age and above. <laughs> so they, they have a different set of concerns and they don't have the same set of fears. They have some very, very serious life-threatening fears like climate change ahead of them. So I think they have just a completely different approach and I think the more we can get young people talking about this. We are very excited to do that with you. We would love to do that with Maps of Freedom School, and I think that should just be happening in general, educationally and otherwise. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jay Matthew Zimmerman, born and raised in Maplewood, New Jersey, graduate of Columbia High School, maybe one of the younger people, although perhaps not the, uh, the young folks that we're aiming to target. On the theme of solidarity, I wanted to go back to something that you had actually said, Layla, about how the issue with Israel is the way that it was created, the foundation of its inception. And this recalled for me something I was reading earlier today about how legal racism in America is intentional. It was created, and this country that was supposedly founded on liberty and freedom institutionalized these policies of discrimination um, against um, to divide the working classes of European and African descent, to protect the wealth of the wealthy and prevent rebellion. And so it's not a coincidence, for many reasons, but it's not a coincidence that Israel is seeking an alliance with America, um, not just politically, but socially. They're founded with these same flaws in, right from the inception. And the United States is still a settler colonial state, right? Yeah. Just like Israel. We still have about 10 minutes. Do you want to make your announcement? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Come on. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned previously, uh, the conversation politically about Palestine and Israel exists in a vacuum and it's very heavily one sided. Uh, but it doesn't mean that we sit on our hands and do nothing. So, um, we actually have a coalition that many people in this room are a part of, of different organizations in the state of New Jersey that try to handle the political advocacy work um, in, for just policies on Palestine throughout the state. Uh, we're getting better as time goes on, and we are a very dedicated group, but it's a lot to handle sometimes when there's so much uh, one is facing. Uh, my organization, American Muslims for Palestine, is holding its sixth annual Palestine Advocacy Day on, uh, on Capitol Hill early this April, so April 5th to April 8th. And the idea is to have this nationwide event, right, that's, ha that's been growing over the past six years exponentially at a significant rate from across the country so that people can be motivated to be the leaders within their own state to build the foundation 
for an effective and efficient response to these bills that are popping up left and right, right? Because we are, let's be honest, we're not starting at zero, we're starting at negative when it comes to political advocacy, but it's on us to be you know, ethical, to be conscious, and to at least speak up and raise our voices. Um, so what our, uh, our, our event is, it's a three-day event in Washington, D.C. Um, on the 6th and the 7th, it's two full days of training. And training on how to be politically active and grassroots organizing generally. It will be uh, sessions from Government 101 to having a panel session with different with congr uh, staffers from congressional and Senate offices. And then also on the talking points that we're going to be discussing on the Monday, April 8th, when we meet with our congressional and Senate representatives. So this is a foundation building event that's going into its sixth year. And New Jersey at the moment is leading with registrants in the whole country. We have about 70 registrants. We're looking to get about 100 from throughout the state. That's not a lot, but it beats the 10 that we started with five years ago. And that's the idea here. It's gradual and effective change to where we can encourage those around us to have conscious, to be conscious and to, uh, you know, uh, not only talk about Palestine, but also learn these skills to be advocating for so many other issues. When we go to these offices, we ensure that we talk about, uh, I'm not gonna call it criminal justice reform, but like a true like assessment of, the, of criminal justice in America, and also communities that don't have access to proper um, nourishments, to proper supermarkets, so on and so forth. So it's very important to be a, in a part of these events. And I'm gonna be handing out these pop cards on the event, and we'd love for everybody to join us if you're able to, and if not, you can pass along the word. I have a business card. Uh, I can share information that you can share if you'd like to. Thank you. Your time, you'll be our, oh, did you want to speak? Yeah. Come on up, you'll be our last speaker. Oh. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> yeah, hi, good evening. My name is Ashraf Fatif, uh, a resident of, uh, of South Orange for over 25 years. I have four kids uh, through the school system. I'm also a pharmacist by profession and the chairman of the, uh, the National Islamic Association, Masjid in Newark, uh, New Jersey. Um, I really congratulate this opportunity, you know, uh, the, uh, the team for setting up such a wonderful educational <coughs> core. I think what is so critical is education on this topic because it seems to taboo, especially. Um, you know, I'm a resident in South Orange where there's at least five synagogues and there's a lot of relationship with the Jewish community and somehow the topic, when it's addressed, it, it makes you, it's, it forces you to feel uncomfortable when it's not supposed to be an, un uh, an uncomfortable topic because it's a topic of discrimination and not, it has anything to do with anti-Semitism. So uh, I appreciate, you know, uh, explaining to us, you know, the strategy of discussing the topic so that we can become so much more, you know, the, the topic can become easier discussed. And so when you have to speak on the, on the topic of BDS, that you shouldn't feel uncomfortable in raising the issue among your peers uh, uh, in the residence in South Orange. So I thank you so much for the opportunity and uh, I'm hoping that, um, that, you know, such uh, forums that we can make it much more uh, um, publicized and also we can organize in other communities. Just one question I have, uh, you mentioned that uh, there was a movement to try to get you know, Maplewood to pass. W was this attempted in South Orange? I, I think they stopped there after that. Oh, okay, so I just wanted to make sure that it wasn't passed in South Orange. Oh, I so see, yeah. I just wanted no. to make sure. So no, no, we to... stopped them in their tracks, but I think, <laughs> they, I think they didn't try to after that. I think oh, they didn't okay. attempt to, yeah. So wonderful, well, thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, thank you very much for coming. Any last thoughts from our speakers? Thanks for coming. Thank you. We'd love to hang around and chat for a few minutes and have some refreshments at the back before we have to leave here at 9. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Everybody. Thanks very much for coming, folks. Thank you.